All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Book, and we learn more about the author. So I'm James Rizzone, and we are talking today with Jasper Scott, the phenomenal sci-fi author. So how are you doing today, Jasper? I'm doing great. Thanks, James. But great to be here. Awesome. So what we like to try and do is learn more about the author. A lot of people like to interview you guys and talk about your books and your series, which is great, and we will do a little bit about that. But I think what a lot of the readers want to know is your backstory, who you are and how you became an author. So a couple of the questions that we want to I'd like to ask you is what where, where did you grow up and what was your first job you held? All right. Well, I grew up in Canada and actually in Calgary, which is Alberta. It's kind of the Midwest, well, a little bit farther west than the Midwest, but it's very cold and, you know, kind of boring landscape except for the mountains. And I grew up there until I was about, I think I was 10 when we moved away. We left to the east side, which is Ontario. And then we went from there a couple of years later to the far west side in British Columbia and spent my time all over Canada until I was 19. And then I left for Panama with my parents and my brother and our dog. And we drove down from Canada to Panama. Wow. So as far as you can get in a car, that's how far we went. Because then that you get to the canal experience. and you and you're done. Yeah, that was an experience. Twenty three days in a in a minivan driving pretty much nonstop every day. And so what was it like driving through through all of essentially all of Mexico and all of Mexico, Central America? all of Central America? Like? Well, I mean it was a different experience for every every different country, but Mexico is just one experience anyway, was it was just a lot longer the trip through Mexico than what it looked like it should be on a map because when you're going through the U.S. you've got these great highways and it takes you like three days to get from the northern end to the southern tip and that's what it took us basically unless you're going down the the coast we just went straight to the border with Mexico and it took us three days nice and uh then after that Mexico WTF man what happened here (laughs) what's that yeah (laughs) Mexico it took us a week you know actually eight days to get through wow yeah. What, kind, what was the roads like? Is it just? Oh my very, goodness! Very well, weird. just no shoulder. People, you know, driving at speeds, and you know, the rain is something else because we were driving down in, at such a time that it was actually pretty rainy in Mexico, and it it would just pour like it would rain so hard you couldn't even see on you know through your windshield, and it didn't matter how fast your window wipers were going, it just forget about it, pull over, wow. you know. And so we did several times. We just pulled over and waited for the rain to pass because it was just so hard you couldn't see. And yeah, no shoulder on the road, so very dangerous too. What was the rest of Central America like getting, getting down through there? Well, first I'll just touch a little bit more on Mexico. There were some really great parts in spite of, you know, being dangerous and crazy. Uh, the one thing I didn't like, lots of dogs and, you know, stray dogs on the roads all over the place. Like never seen more stray dogs in my life and sad, really sad looking ones. Like yeah. any other country in Central America was better than Mexico for that. But anyway, the good part was when we were going down, we actually went, instead of going through Mexico City because of all the rain, we were advised to go down the coast. It would be drier. So we went down the coast through Cancun and man, uh, Puerto Vallarta and a few of those places are really touristy. And they really are very beautiful. So I would, I would definitely go back to visit those. Um, but yeah, the rest of the countries after Mexico, it just got progressively worse in some senses because of the, you know, the safety aspect and how safe you feel with the, the environment in the country. Wow. And, and also just the police, because the police are so corrupt, they'll stop you for anything. And then they're, they're there with their hands out, you know, asking for a bribe. Oh, wow. you know? And especially at the borders where they, they invent any excuse to not let you pass the border or just to delay endlessly waiting for you to bribe them to let you through. So it would huh. be like, not so much in Mexico and American border, that was pretty well regulated but after that every other country they'll just take your papers and you'll be there for three maybe six hours waiting before they give them back and the only way you're actually really going to get through and get them back is you give them a bribe so and they I'm usually so you usually you know they'll they'll give you some sort of a hint but it's a, it's one of those barter systems where you're like all right so it's 40 bucks enough shakes his head <laughs> you know and you keep going up until the guy's satisfied and it's basically based on what he thinks you can pay <laughs> so yeah we ended up so you just hand him a, do you hand him your papers with a couple twenties or a hundred dollar bill? Yeah, you just ha- you just hide it in your papers or whatever. But I mean, sometimes it's not even that regulated where you have to hide it. It's just open. You they don't care. Like they're shameless about it. Wow. So in some cases we ended up paying like I think it was like 150 bucks 
in you know bribe just in one border crossing in total probably was like 600 bucks in bribes yeah that's pretty Which that's pretty interesting pretty that's crazy story <laughs> yeah and and you don't have to do that if you're really patient and you just stick to your you know like hey i don't have to pay anything through this border i don't know what you're inventing here you know eventually they'll let you go but you're gonna have to wait around all day <laughs> so it depends how how much of a hurry you're like you're yeah in. my time's worth some money here's 50 bucks yeah exactly <laughs> basically at, at that point you you kind of like get frustrated but yeah. otherwise <laughs> so what was your first job my first job well okay so i was 19 when i moved to panama and you know when you arrive in a foreign country especially I mean, I wouldn't say because of the age, but mostly because, you know, I didn't necessarily get all my papers in, in order right away. I couldn't work, right? I didn't have the necessary permits to work here. And also the jobs here kind of suck. Like the pay is really low. So mm. you're starting at a minimum salary of like $500 a month. Wow. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I just didn't bother for a long time. But my first job was like, uh, man, it was, it was, they pay you per job. It was modeling. So I would do like be an extra in a TV commercial or be on front of a magazine or something because not so much because I'm the best looking guy, but mostly because down here, for whatever reason, they have this like re weird reverse racism where like most of them have like a mixed race. Right. And they're not all like European and blonde hair. Well, sure. almost none of them. And then, so then they look for what's different, which is me yeah. and I have blonde hair and they're like, okay, well you're going to stand out. Right. Yeah. And they just promote things with, basically people from other countries to get people's How'd you attention. Get that gig? How'd you land that? Thing? Man, I got that gig Your because model. a friend of a friend was the owner of a modeling agency. Well, not a friend of a friend. It was, it was, yeah, a friend of a friend, basically. It was an owner of a modeling agency and he just basically contacted me on Facebook. It was a gay guy, but not that I have anything against that. It's just, you know, usually they are in that business and I wasn't. Yeah. So it's like a bit of a thing there, but yeah, he contacted me and said, you know, would you like to audition for this part? And I'm like, well, I could use the money. So I went and sure, auditioned and, and it, you know, that led to other gigs, but it wasn't like a lot of money or, or definitely wasn't steady money. So it was just a little bit here and there that I could make from, <laughs> from these weird modeling jobs, mostly TV so commercials. Do, have, have any of your readers, do any of them ever know that you were a male model at one point? Or is this like you know, I think I used thing? to advertise it because I thought it was like this weird, like you wouldn't expect it kind of thing. So I used to advertise and then I started to think, well, but there's a real stigma attached to male models. Maybe I shouldn't advertise that. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are they thinking of me? A writer who is a model? He must be really dumb. Yeah, that's basically <laughs> the stigma, you know, like Zoolander kind of thing. So I'm like, hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I think a lot of people, especially my early fans, did know. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So now when, when did you publish your first book? My first book, well, I actually published my first book in 2012, first sci-fi book anyway. Wow, it's quite a while ago, eight yeah. years ago. Yeah, eight years ago, exactly. And I think the very first one was called Escape, right? And that was something I wrote and I just threw it out there. It wasn't even edited. It was full of typos. You know, really not my best work. And it just crushed it, didn't it? Because it, it didn't. Wild, wild, it, wild. No, it, it didn't. It didn't crush it. It actually got like an average of three and a half star rating. Uh, okay. It was a struggle just to get more than maybe 10 reviews. I ended up getting like 20 something, or maybe in the end it was 40 something, but okay. really not a lot for, for me. And then, I mean, I sold it at 99 cents too for a long time and didn't make much money out of it, but I kind of learned from that, especially from what people were saying in the reviews, yep. like the feedback, I started to figure out, okay, well, one thing I need to edit better because people were complaining about the typos. Yeah. And I, I got some other tips about like, what they didn't like. And I started to think, okay, well, I'll, I'll do better next time. You Reviews know, and then I, very helpful sometimes. yeah, they, they were. And then I moved on, I went to a fantasy book and it was called Mirtham. And you know, that one actually got better reviews, but sold even less. Right. Okay. I was breaking into a new genre and for me, fantasy just didn't work, or at least that's what I concluded after writing that book and it had good reviews, but didn't sell well. Okay. So then after that, I retooled and went to write something again in sci-fi. And I wrote a book called, I think I tentatively had called it Survivors or something like that. Okay. And That's kinda cool. I never published it because I, when I was done, I read it and I'm like, this, is, this isn't actually any good. <laughs> so I just <laughs> left it there. I'm like, nope, got to go back to the drawing board. And so then I started again with some of the same ideas, not a lot of them, just a few little things. And so then, it's just a good draft. 
yeah, it was a draft. And then I, I went on, I'm like, okay, well now I need to write something quick because I'm, I just got married. I have a lot of bills piling up and, you know, I have a honeymoon and I got to pay for that too. And I'm basically making no money. My wife's making more than me and she doesn't even make that much, all things considered. So it's like, how am I going to even pay for food? So I yeah. started to like get more focused. And so what, I wrote, what series was your big one? The one that really dark broke space. it out for you? Dark space. And that was what I wrote. That was what I wrote next was dark space. In three weeks, I put out dark space one and edit it and put it out there with a good cover and, and, and everything. And <laughs> then I went on my honeymoon and kind of like forgot about it. Now, when was this? This was 2000. This was 2013, April. Okay. All right. Isn't it amazing and, how when you're like in that moment where it's make or break, it's do or die. You yeah. sat down and that was the time you cranked out the book that just did it for you. Yeah. I mean, for me, that was like, I wouldn't call it coincidence, but I mean, for the, me, that was the turning point. And it was like, wow. So that really took off. And it was kind of funny how it happened too, because I was on my honeymoon. I wasn't even paying attention. And then I come back and I look at my sales reports and I'm like, what the heck? I'm making thousand dollars. I mean, a thousand pounds actually it was in the last month I made a thousand pounds. So it did really well in the UK. And I'm like, wow. In the U S I think it made me like four or 500 bucks. Right. Wow. And I'm like, well, this is starting to be a salary, at least in Panama, that's a good salary. So yeah. I was like, okay, I can live on this, add it to my wife's salary, we're good, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think one of the things I did do though in the beginning, I, I forget how early on is I gave it away for free for five days mm -hmm. and it, it got 10,000 free copies uh, wow. given away during that time. And then it just started to get reviews. And as the reviews piled in, uh, I guess it just picked up momentum in, as a paid book as well. Wow, and yeah, it, it started to make some decent money, even at 99 cents. That's where it was priced at. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible, though. It's, it's such a unique uh, story and how it just took off because you're, you're just getting married, yeah. new husband, you got no money. You're like, no money. I was dirt idea. broke. You, you put this thing together, you put it up and boom, it just takes off and goes. So what, what did you follow that up with then? Okay, well, obviously, at that point, I'm like, well, this is doing well i better write the sequel so i wrote the sequel as fast as i could i think i did in two months and i was i was under the gun still so i was getting up at like 4 a.m every morning to write yeah. which i'm too i'm too much of a, a pansy to do that now but <laughs> but i i used to be pretty you know good about getting up early and all that so then i'd be up at 4 a.m writing and i'd just write 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 and in two months i had the book done and that was the second book the sequel to dark space and when i put that one out there I put it out, I think at one ninety nine. I wanted to go up really slowly and just encourage people to buy as cheaply as they could so I could get my name out there. Gotcha. And so then that one, when it came out, I, start, I noticed that collectively I was selling 900 copies a day. Wow. You know, between the first two books. And I'm like, that's wow, great. that's a lot. That you know, and it, was, and it was a lot of money. Actually, between just those two books, I think my first paycheck after that was, I think it was $15,000. Dang. Yeah. And that was, that was in September or thereabouts of 2013. So and you're then like, after, wow, we're buying a house, babe. We're, we're, we're well, loaded. almost. I mean, actually, we, I had this really old beater of a car. It was a, an old Mercedes that was older than me, like uh, turbo diesel 300D, I think it was. It really old car, right? And it was, it was okay, but it was starting to, to act up on me and break down every five minutes. So I, first thing I did is I waited a couple – you know, months for the money to pile up. And then I went and bought a car, <laughs> I like it. bought myself a new car. And I'm like, okay, it's not going to break down anymore. It's new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brand new. Yeah. So, yeah. and then after that, it was just renting and for a couple of years till we could get it, you know, to a point where we could buy a house. But so what inspires you to write? What, what goes through your thought process in creating some of these epic stories that have, you know, allowed you to sell a million plus copies around the world. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm inspired by a lot of things. I like to read and when I read other people's work, a lot of times ideals, ideas will just pop into my head. A lot of the time they're completely unrelated with what I'm reading, but it's just kind of puts my mind in that creative uh, zone where I can have ideas come to me. And then the other way I'm inspired is I look at what I enjoyed. I look at like TV or movies, popular science fiction, and I look at those concepts and ideas that people have already used successfully. And I think, well, how can I create something that I would like that's similar, but not, you know, a rip off. Yeah. Your you know, own and, style. And exactly. Something similar. So with dark space, some of the inspiration that went into that was Battlestar Galactica, which was yep. my all time favorite 
sci-fi yeah. series. Love that series. That it's it's the best. Too. Yeah. Yeah. The Expanse is, is a close. It's not second on my list, but it's really high up there as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that that's my main inspiration is just looking at popular science fiction things that I enjoyed and trying to copy that more like the feeling more than actually the the actual book or movie or whatever it was is copy that that sense. So, for example, one of the things I really enjoyed was Stargate Universe, and yeah. in that series, you know, they're all about pushing forward and exploring new worlds, and you know, they have this goal they're trying to get to. I forget it was the edge of the galaxy, basically. And it was just really cool series for me. I really liked that. So then that inspired Dark Space Universe, which you can tell the, the parallel there, Stargate Universe, Dark Space Universe. Sure. And the, I would say the only the first book of that you know, series for me, Dark Space Universe, was similar. But yeah, it was also inspired by something I'd watched. Now you write, you write sci-fi and military sci-fi. Do you read outside your genre to help give you some inspiration or ideas on how to craft things better and come up with better dialogue or story plots and things like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, actually sometimes I do. I'll I'll read uh man, I used to read a lot of horror, but not not all of it. I like some, I don't like others, but I used to read Stephen King and Dean R. Koontz. Um I haven't lately, but I should say I haven't within the last year. But anyway, I read that and I've also read um mysteries, crime thrillers. Okay. Um, those kinds of books. I haven't actually gone to real war stories. I probably should because that would be more directly relatable to what I write. Uh, mm -hmm. Actual, more like what you write, you know? Yeah. Uh, but that would give me some of the authenticity, I think, that's missing. And in, in a lot of cases, I just try to dodge that issue by not going with 100% military characters or their ex-military or, yeah. you know, like, so there's, for me, there's a little bit of leeway then to not have to deal with the command structure and and the way people would actually talk in the military because yeah. people do call me out on that sometimes. Like I think I had a few that were more military focused books and people would call me out and say, you know, this is not quite how people in that situation would react in the military or what they would say. And I'm like, well, I guess I, I wouldn't know, <laughs> but yeah, it would probably help to, to read, you know, some books that would tell me how they, they act. We, we get a little bit of flack with that in regards to um, like the use of profanity. Now, I, I spent 10 years in the military, eight years working as a contractor for the military. So I know that the second commandment is thou shalt use profanity in every sentence. <laughs> and that is a very flippant thing used. Yeah. And as you can tell, my little one is just to be a little fussy, but you know, we're all in quarantine, so we're stuck together. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you know, profanity is obviously used excessively in the military. But you know, my wife and I co-write together, and we've made we've made the the conscious choice that we're not going to have profanity in any of our our books that we write. So, you know, any, anything we do, we have no sexual content or. or oh profanity. wow, that's interesting. So it's a conscious decision. I I take a lot of flack from my military readers because. Yeah, I, they're gonna say that's they, not I how they talk. I know, and I, and I, tell, <laughs> I know, I know, but. I'm just trying to yeah. make a PG. I'm yeah, to I get it. So everyone can read it because I remember growing up when I was, you know, 13, 14, I would love to read some of these military war books. But yeah. they were so laced with profanity, it was very difficult to get my parents to let me. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that makes sense. Like as a kid, you're kind of boxed out of that genre unless correct. you find somebody young, who's young teenager who's wise. walking the line. Yeah. And so I mean we tried to do that. And it, and it's a little bit I guess different because you're not really writing YA, you're not writing young adult. Mm. You're yeah. just avoiding the profanity and, and other content. Well, so. it's just sometimes you, you can convey it in other ways sometimes. And yeah. now for my purposes, because of the way my brain thinks, sometimes I will usually write and just have it profanity laced. But then when it goes to my wife who adds in her parts of the book, uh, she edits that language out and puts right. it something else. But I do it so that way I can convey what it should say. <laughs> yeah right I get you out. well you know I've you been, know, you I've been very you out a replacement <laughs> I don't know I've been very controversial on that score I think because I started out with Dark Space it was very popular my most popular series and sold the most of, of anything I've written and that was laced with profanity but it wasn't profanity the way we know it. it was profanity like in Battlestar Galactica where you can oh, kind yeah. of guess what the word should be but it's not the actual word yeah you know, it's, it's all euphemisms too. you know yeah. I thought about so, going that route as well, but right. I'm like, and 
then everyone's gonna say, "Oh, you're just copying Battlestar Galactica." And and, and they did. They some of them told me that. Others were like, "Oh, I wish you would have just used the real words." And blah blah blah. I get readers on both sides of the fence reviewing and saying, "I liked it. I didn't like it." And it was just controversial. But for me, it worked. I mean, Dark Space still did very well. I don't think it stopped people from reading. But there were a couple that said, "I'm not gonna read on because I just hate the fake swear words." And uh, <laughs> whatever, you always gonna entirely. <laughs> You're always going to get somebody. I mean, you can't please everybody. I think that's the, the thing to take away from that. But yeah. then I actually did listen to those reviews because there were a lot of them. I actually did listen to those reviews. And then with my next series after Dark Space, I, I used real words. I used the real profanity, right? And then it did very well as well. And I was like, huh. And I didn't get any of those negative reviews saying you didn't use real swear words. you know. So I thought, okay, it looks like my audience translates very well to both. I can do either or. So yeah. I did at that point, I just decided, okay, it's going to depend on the series. Does it make sense to use euphemisms? Is it far enough into the future that words might have changed or not? Yeah. And I, with space opera, a lot of times you can get away with it. Yeah. And we've, like, we're taking, an, I'm taking a break from the, you know, the military espionage thrillers I write to do sci-fi. You know, we've been talking about that new sci-fi yeah. series I've been working on. And even in that series, I, I, I'm still not using any profanity in it. We've still kept it clean. But you know, you, you're not the first person who, who went that route. Star Trek, the original series, uh, you know, anyway, yeah, didn't cool. have profanity because it was this sort of utopian view of humanity. Like we got to this point where we're above all that, yep. you know, and that's cool. I mean, that, that works as well if that's your take on things. And you can also get away with it in the future. Thing. It's a brandy thing at this point. Yeah, you know, you it, it definitely is. If you've, if you've never introduced real profanity in your books, you're going to have a problem because you will turn people away. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I, you know, flip-flopped back and forth and hopped around on that issue. So at this point, whoever's still with me doesn't mind one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at this point, we've been doing it for five years. So yeah, that's kind of the same thing. And, and, Pretty and much. Do, when we write all our military scenes, you know, I've got a, about a 90 person strong beta team. And so what I oh, do, good. they're all, they're all broke down by military branches too. So oh, when nice. I write a scene that is very Marine centric, I send those scenes to my Marine beta readers. And then the same with right. the army guys. And that way I get the terminology and the verbiage the same. Exactly. The way it's that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so yeah, it I should. Helps because then the series, it's, it's really real. You know, I've got scenes that are, you know, by Navy SEALs or Green Berets or Rangers. Well, it's been, it's been gone over by a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret. Exactly. Or a to make sure the scene looks the way it should. The equipment is right. The terminology is right. So when it all gets pieced back together, that book is really freaking good. It's That's very- really great that you have that, that, you know, authentic uh, experience to call on. I think you probably were also, I think you mentioned you were in the military, so you have yep. some of your own as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I spent about, I spent three and a half years in Iraq, so I mean, I've been in a combat zone for an extended oh, wow. period of time and just seen how things really work over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when well, we that, talking that's... about rockets and mortars coming in, I've sat yeah. through hundreds of those before, so I know what it's like. Well, you've got the, you've got really good real world, world experience to draw on as well then, which just yeah. that's great i i don't have any of that and in a way that's a blessing you know because yeah. not everybody went you know came home from iraq so you, well, you, you could know, be when you come home the the war never fully goes it never away. leaves you, you know, exactly it's always in your head you know yeah you no and that that's true and but at least you know you were able to turn it into something positive i think and that experience into something positive not that it's always a negative experience but it definitely does mark you i think and and that's something too well, be aware well, of I think when you're writing is well. good therapy, to be honest with you. I, I wrote my first book was um, Interview with a Terrorist because my job when I was in the military, I was an interrogator. So we were terrorist hunters. And so my first wow. book was essentially just talking about my job, what we did. Just you know, unload. I can't even imagine you as an interrogator, actually. You seem like such a nice guy. I'm thinking, okay, so were you the good cop or the bad cop? <laughs> well, you know, it, interrogations is really nothing more than just co- casual conversations eliciting information um, yeah you know, being yeah i think that it's not always going to work the, the movies and, and and tv we watch a lot of time will distort how it really goes down because you know they they want to put in those torture scenes and make it dramatic but the reality is we all know torture doesn't get you the real answers you know not it gets one, you false answers you want, exactly you know, it, it depends on how you go about doing it what you're doing it doing but to be honest with you it's far better to get them to willingly give it up because then it is more accurate exactly Um, a lot of time it's just it's trading it's horse trading i have something they want they have something i want 
you know. Yes, it's negotiating <laughs> in, in a very real sense. That's true. It makes they're sense. They're in prison. They want out. Their conditions are pretty crappy. Absolutely. Yeah. They're packed in a, in a quad with usually six to 800 fellow prisoners. And oh. uh, I have the ability to get them into a, uh, a sometimes their own room or a much smaller, better location, even better food. Um, but that right. comes with a price, and that price is cooperation. Well, that that's pretty similar, I think, to the you know setup with police negotiating with with criminals and giving them lighter sentencing and that kind of thing. Concessions. Concessions. Yeah. So if you could learn how to do that, you know, then you could usually be pretty successful. Part of the challenge was, you know, everyone when I was, when I was working with my fellow interrogators, a lot of the guys, you know, they're all Type A personalities, and they're all after the. Where's the weapon cache? I want the sexy weapon cache. I want to know who this guy is. I want you to confess to everything you did. And I just didn't care about any of that stuff. I was like, all right, you're obviously caught. You're here. So you can't do anything about that. So you know what? Let's talk about your village. I don't want to talk about you. I want, I want you to tell me what's going on in your village. Do you guys have power? Do you have food? Do you have water? What, if not, why? And through normal conversations like that, I get them to drop their defenses down. Yeah, you disarm them because yeah, you're disarm. you're talking about their personal lives. And if they can give you straight answers there, they might just keep giving you straight answers about other things. Well, but what you're doing is you're not making Builds it about rapport. them. Builds a rapport. Yeah, you're building yeah. the rapport and the commonality. And then, you know, if they don't have power, well, why? I say, well, this terrorist organization or these groups of people are blowing up the, the, the Transformers or they're cutting the lines. Well, that's yeah. really freaking important to know because we can't win an insurgency if the village isn't getting adequate power or water supply to it because another group of insurgents are interrupting that. So exactly. he may have nothing to do with them, but he'll narc on them. He'll tell me all about them. Yeah, well, exactly. That's, great. that's what I want because then I can send the team out to go arrest them or go, you know, go capture or kill them. And problem solved. Now, did I get him to confess? Hell no. But did I get him to narc on another terrorist group or an organization? Absolutely. Still valuable intel. Still valuable intel. So it's just yeah. figuring out how do you work around the problem? How do you work around the situation to, to meet your end objective, which is, you know, rooting out these people from this particular village, region, or area. Exactly. That's very interesting. Well, so, I'm sure that inspired yeah. a lot of a lot of work. Like you said, I think you said it inspired your first book, Negotiating with a Terrorist. Yeah. Well, originally we titled it Dinner with a Terrorist because I would usually do about half my interrogations over dinner. Go you know, figure. In, yeah, go figure. Because in the Arabic culture, when you sit down to break bread with someone, you guys can't be enemies at that point. Interesting. So what we would do is we would come in, we would sit down, we would first have a, we would smoke a cigarette, we would have uh, some tea, and then we would have a dinner, and then we would smoke a hookah pipe afterwards. Right. And we, throughout this entire process, I would be eliciting information and questioning and asking and talking about this and just casually and i got my uh analyst sitting behind me he's just taking copious notes of everything the guy says <laughs> I, just yeah. keep, I just keep probing and asking questions while we're eating and, and keep going and before you know it, we've milked this guy dry over two hours and he didn't even realize <laughs> what had happened but he got he didn't even problem. realize what was going on no. that's pretty interesting so it worked great you know so well we published that with a uh, um publishing house and it was kind of a shyster in a way we didn't oh know my. it was 2008 you know yeah and so you know we eventually got the rights back and we retitled the interview with the terrorists and, and redid it and you know it's it's done all right since then so well that's good yeah i mean that was right that was before the whole uh digital revolution and publishing right. i mean that really started i think it was 2000 when, when would you say? I think it was 2012 is when I started, but 2010 maybe is when it really started. Uh, probably, yeah, 2010, because I remember at the time I had just learned about a Kindle in two, late, late 2009. I was working in Baghdad for Triple Canopy, you know, Blackwater contract. So I was right. working there with them, and some of the guys there told me about this electronic device called a Kindle. You can yeah. download all kinds of books on and They would sit and read books while they're sitting waiting on missions or whatever. And... Um, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So my wife got me one and sent it over to me. And that's when I first learned about Kindle and Amazon. <laughs> you know? so. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I always had this. For me, it was there was a stigma against self-publishing when I first started writing. I was writing when I was 19. And back then, that was, well, let's do the math. Like That was like 14 years ago. Yeah. Right? And so 14 years ago, that was well before the publishing revolution. 
And, you know, I, there was still a stigma against self-publishing and, and, you know, it's just it wasn't something you would do if you were a serious author, right? And well, then it all I, changed when Kindle came I, on the scene. <laughs> you and I are case in point. We're both making hands down probably double what a trad pub author makes. Oh, more than yeah, double, man. More fun. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, you have more control over it, which is great if you know what to do with that. Yep. And you definitely make more money. I mean, you can't say that. You can't generalize and say that about everybody because there's yep. definitely some people at the top in the, in, you know, the trad pub game where if they try to go all self-pub now, that doesn't work. For example, I think even Stephen King tried to self-publish at some point and it didn't work. Yeah. You know, so there are some, you know, cases where, yeah, they're better off with traditional publishers. But for most of us, that's not true. And, it, and it's interesting because you can... There's no, there's no cap on what you can make with the Amazon. It really is yeah. about creating a book that people want to read and tell their friends about. And then it comes down to social media and digital marketing. How good can you get Absolutely. It? You know, how well can you market and brand it? You know, one of the things that we did early on is we started allowing our, our readers to name the characters, to name, huh. to get really involved in it. Yeah. So in addition to helping to craft the books, I let them name almost all my characters. And so, so they, feel, they feel personally invested after that. Absolutely. And then what they yeah. do is they share it with all their buddies and their friends because they're like, hey, look, I named this character in this book or I helped write this specific chapter. And they right. have a little ownership stake in that and they love yeah. it. And then they share it around with their friends and buddies and it just, it just continues to spread that word. It's actually a good tactic. I've never, never tried that, but I have heard of people doing it just to, you know, give pe readers some more incentive to, to share or, or publicize the book. Well, they like it. They, it gives them some ownership in it and they get vested in the stories more and, you know, be able to do that. And then we, you know, we like to host, we're starting to host these much more, especially with the quarantine now, is we're going to start hosting these, uh, uh, weekly uh, Q and A's with the author, or I'm just going to set up a Zoom call like this and just let everyone jump on. I can hold a hundred people on here, right? And, uh, just ask questions and you know talk about the series, talk about the characters. What what do you think about this scene? How do you like that? And then go over all that stuff and let them ask questions because they have questions they like to ask the author. How do you come up with this kind of stuff? You know, right? Yeah, I mean it, it's kind of a mystery to a lot of people, I guess. Yeah, and Facebook Live is, is okay, and I've used it in the past, and I probably will still use it in the future, but I like the ability to have the backgrounds that we can yeah, do. Yeah, I mean, if I had well, mine set up, <laughs> it yeah, takes a well, bit of preparation to get it working like yours, but it's really cool. And also being able to record it, because we can record it, and we can upload them to, to YouTube to be able to share them much easier, whereas if it's on Facebook Live, they try to lock it that. down. Yeah, I can't move that to YouTube, and I've, I'm Interesting. limited in what I can use it for and do. So yeah, no, that's not as good I, then. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of neat. So what are some it other is. things that your readers don't know about you that they might really find interesting? Well, let's see. I mean, besides the fact that I live in Central America, which we discussed. Um, you drove from Canada all the way down to Panama. Drove from Canada all the way to Panama. I didn't do it, though. It wasn't me driving at the wheel. It was actually my dad. I was just in the middle seat of the minivan, kind of cringing every time. <laughs> <laughs> we had a near call close call with a truck or something but just, yeah just uh, it was still stressful don't worry about it <laughs> pretty much i was just <laughs> nope don't look <laughs> but uh other things people don't know man i, I don't what's know, your favorite man. food down there in panama what do you like favorite food okay well there's one thing in canada you know we don't have a, really a, a national or cultural uh, type of food it's really? i think in the u.s it's somewhat similar like you have a few things but nothing really identifiable yeah, we as stole food from everyone and just call it our own right it's a, it's a melting mixing pot of different cultures and different foods and so you have all the different restaurants from different ethnic uh types of food but down here everybody does have a style of you know what they eat so they'll have their rice and they'll have their beans and you know maybe a piece of chicken and sometimes like uh, plantain which you could either fry yeah. or turn into a, a kind of like a fried food which they call patacones and that's a smashed version of it uh but yeah that's the food down here and it's almost always like that like that's your lunch it doesn't really vary much and they don't have a lot of the the junk food that we're used to like yeah and definitely don't have the same proportions of types of food for example meat might be like a small part of the meal whereas in yeah. north america you might find is actually maybe the primary part or half of the meal you know, it, it could be a big chunk of steak and then just some potatoes on the side. 
they don't really do that here. I mean, that's, that's uncommon. Mm. So mostly it's the rice and the beans, that's a staple. And you have a little bit of meat to go with that. So I, I adapted to eating new, you know, foods and, and different way of eating because that's what we have for lunch every day. And it's like, I got used to it. I actually take now I'm, yeah. I'm used to, I enjoy it. But uh, that was something. What are some of the things you like to do down in Panama for fun? Oh man. I mean, Panama, it's a small country. So a lot of the time for fun, we'll travel. That's something I can't do right now, but that's something we, we usually do. And then in the country itself, we'll go, we'll go watch movies because movies are cheaper than, you know, in North America. So movie sure. ticket will cost us like, I think now they're a lot more expensive than they used to be, but it's like $6 for an adult at most. And okay. it could be four bucks for a kid. And that's really cheap compared to at least compared to Canada, where it could be as much as $15 for an adult. Yeah. Uh, Canadian dollars anyway. Yeah. And then besides movies, we'll go to shopping malls. It's kind of like a Panamanian thing. You, you all go to the shopping mall, you go out on a Sunday or a Saturday, you'll go to the mall and, and then maybe you'll watch a movie, you know, or you'll eat out and you'll watch a movie. So that's something we do a lot and we'll go for walks and there's like a, a place we can do that, but we have to go in the afternoon. It's not too hot. There's a, like a boardwalk, I guess we call it along the water. And it's a pretty cool place to do that. Go for a walk at night. How do you like the, uh, the the various beaches that you guys have there and some of the other things there? Well, I mean, I wish they had more really nice swimmable beaches close to the city where I live. Um, they're actually probably the best beaches are an hour to two hours away. So yeah. you got to drive pretty good distance before you get to a decent beach. And my parents actually have a, a house close to a beach, which is swimmable. The sand is not all white, but it doesn't matter to me. And it's actually a nice beach. So we go there pretty often. We go for a weekend and go to the beach. How's the cost of living down there? Is it, is it pretty reasonable for, for someone? I think that depends what, uh, what area you look at living in. Like there's, there's places that are as expensive or more expensive than the U.S. Um, you know, for cost of real estate anyway. And then there's other places that are just dirt cheap. And usually that, that comes along with things you don't like. Like the area is not so great. It's maybe not so safe. The amenities aren't so good. Um, but if you want to be in a nice area, I wouldn't say it's cheaper. The only thing that is cheaper is services. So for example, if you want to get your car washed, that's going to cost you like seven bucks. You know, if you want to, and that'll be a person washing it, not a machine. If you yeah. want to get your hair cut. It's the same thing. It's about $7. And I, I have a full-time nanny and she charges us a little bit. Well, all told it's about $600 a month that we pay. But that's between insurance and various things. And uh, yeah, some things are a lot cheaper. Like I couldn't imagine having a full-time nanny who helps to, you know, keep the house clean and organized. In Canada, it's not possible. You'd have to be a multimillionaire. And the same thing for the U.S. for the most part. Like you have to have a lot of money to be able to afford that. Yeah. And it's like, it's just not an option, you know. <laughs> yeah. But so there's some definitely some differences in, in lifestyle here. Uh, that's That's probably one of the biggest ones I could point to is anybody who has – a reasonable quality of life here will have a live-in uh, probably for either the child care reasons or to keep their house clean. That's something and that you lose or just comes every day. It could be either. It's up to the person who's paying, you know, but in, in most cases it's somebody who lives with you and there's actually the houses come with a special room and bathroom just for that person, you know, an extra room and bathroom. Wow. So we, we call it a servant's quarters or, or maid's quarter. It's basically, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. So <laughs> yeah, that's my just wife, because, yeah, sorry, what you're, you're saying? Let's say my, my wife and I are looking at in a couple of years here as our kids get a little, well, we may have started this sooner actually, uh, homeschooling our kids. Um, because as you know, as an author, you just need internet and a laptop. Yeah, you can live exactly. Anywhere. And so we, we kind of like the idea of help letting our kids be, you know, digital nomads and taking them to, Living in an Airbnb for two months in different countries in different and and that's the one of the major advantages of doing that and that that speaks to another thing that not everybody probably knows about me I was actually homeschooled from As was grade I. three oh were you okay kindergarten through through twelve yeah I'm guessing in your case you come from a military family and that's why no actually no. I wasn't I wasn't you weren't okay was that my parents just decided they wanted to homeschool us and so they homeschooled us and wow you know, I I still went on to go to college. I, I actually went on to a graduate uh, degree program at the University of Oxford. So, I mean, wow. the school did not uh, hinder me. Limit you. That, well, yeah. my experience was pretty similar. I mean, I was homeschooled from grade three to 12, and it was really the same curriculum as what the public schools in Canada used. It is, yeah. It was really class. the same. 
and I had to have externally exactly. graded tests and, and exams and everything, and even provincial exams. And I just, I did very well, but I had no point of reference, like how well I was actually doing until I graduated and then had to take, uh, well, down in Panama, they have a few U.S. campuses. So when I went to university, I went to one of those because it was English. And yeah. in order to get in, I had to take the SATs. And then I took the SATs and I'm like, huh, so based on that score, I'm actually pretty smart. <laughs> like I just didn't know <laughs> growing up I had nobody to compare to so I'm like yeah I get A's most most of the times some B's I just had no you know idea or concept of was I at the top of the class or not and yeah. you know taking the SATs finally gave me that kind of perspective and I'm like huh okay that's that's nice <laughs> but I didn't really go to a great university though because down here not a, a lot of options so it was Louisville which is kind of middle of the pack I think it's okay. like campus of Louisville. It's not bad. It's not like Ivy League or something, but not like well, I could have afforded day, that. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, you just need a, you know, the degree is a degree. Yeah. Just a, it's, at this point, it's just a checkbox. It's not well, as relevant. I mean, to you know, and, and speaking to that, I didn't even finish the degree. I was studying business and I did, I think, a year and a half and that was it. And I, I quit to write full time. And there were a couple of other reasons for that. It wasn't just so that I could write full time. But basically, it ended up not being something I needed. I guess in my current career, it's not like you need a degree. It's more like, yeah. what do you learn along the way? And do you have the, you know, what it takes to, to manage all those elements. And now you, you run your own, your own business aside from your own writing though, right? You're, you're setting up where you're doing your own imprint as well. Or I, I started one. Yeah. And we've just put it on pause because of this whole crisis and I'm trying not to bleed more money than I have to, but it, yeah. it is still on the back burner there as something that I, I'd like to do. It's just, for me, the, the, the hard part of that business, more than anything, is actually finding good quality manuscripts, finding good quality talent, you know, yeah. and, and knowing, being able to tell if it's a good quality or not. And yeah. how much time does it take to even figure that out? Like, yeah. I don't have necessarily all the time in the world to be reading submissions, yeah. you know, so I have to actually have people for that that we pay to read submissions and tell me, is it good or not? And then just, if it isn't, we move on, you know? So it's, it's a whole process to figure out how to do that. And I'm, I'm getting there. I'm figuring it out. But for the moment, it's definitely on pause. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking with uh, Jeff Cheney because you know, he's got, he's been doing that himself. Oh, yeah. He's, oh, wow. he's, 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 he's been he's rocking probably, it. He's, he's, he's going to get 47 North a run for their money in a few years, I think. He might. I mean, yeah, he's got a very interesting business going there. And I'm, I'm super impressed with what he's managed to put together. I think, you know, it's come to the point for him anyway, where that is – most of really, mostly what he does, he doesn't have a lot of time for writing anymore. And yeah. that's, for me, the other side of it is I don't want to stop writing. So I have to find a way to, to grow a business on the side without making it my primary focus. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a, the hard trick because I've thought about doing that as well in um, you know, the military uh, thriller space because there's, there's a huge opportunity in it. Um, uh, but at the same point, it just takes so much time to, it does. to do that. And I don't know if I'm willing to pause what I'm doing because you know how it is where you, you, release, you develop a release cycle. And as long as you stay in that cycle and you keep things going, you can kind of ride a pretty good six-figure yep, wave. Exactly. But if and you deviate from that, it could all come crashing down. Well, I can give you an example. Last year, I did deviate from that. I went to Audible and I said, hey, let's do a simultaneously published Kindle and audio deal, right? I've got this idea for these standalone books. Let's do them together, you know, publish them yeah. both formats at the same time. And the problem with that is they have a, like a long lead time on those projects. They need at least three months, right? So I was used to, I'm done writing, I edit, and then I publish, right? And that gave me pretty much two and a half to three months. Every two and a half to three months, I'm publishing a book. But then when I switched to simultaneously publishing, I had to wait between releases. I think it was about six to seven months at some point. And in wow. those six to seven That's months huge. that I was waiting, it's huge. Dying. And yeah, so in that time, I had the advance money from Audible and that was part of the reason I negotiated it. I was like, well, I need a decent advance to cover me for these months because I know it's going to be a while, right? And so I, I negotiated something that I thought would be enough. And in the end, it wasn't even close to enough six mm. to seven months waiting my income just kept going down 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 until it was to a point where i couldn't even pay my bills and i'm like okay i'm basically going into debt you know right now what do i do 
How do I now, turn did this it work around? out in the end though when it eventually came out? Did it work out? It did not. And that was the even more disappointing part was I built up to this and then these standalones, one of them did well and the next two didn't. And I'm like, okay, so now I have a problem. I've spent seven months on this. You know, I've delayed my release schedule. My income's gone way down and they didn't deliver. In the end, these books didn't make the money I was expecting them to. And they were really, you know, slow performers for, for me, what I'm used to. And I'm like, okay, so something has to, I have to shake this up somehow. So I thought, okay, well, what I need is to reverse what I just did. I need a quick launch schedule. I need to bring out things quickly. And, yeah. you know, like one a month, something new every month. And so I'm like, well, there's no way I can write that fast. I'm just not yeah, that fast yeah. a writer. Well, that quality stuff, it's too hard. Yeah, it's certainly. The quality would be, it would be impossible for me to write quality books one a month. Uh, even if I didn't have a family and I was just a bachelor, it would be impossible. So I thought, okay, well, what else can I do? I have a big backlist. It's no longer really selling. So then I, I just noticed, you know, my colleague, Nathan Heistad was, you know, telling me how he published this box set of his series and it was making really good money. I'm like, how's that possible? It's 99 cents. You make nothing on that, you know? And he explained to me, no, it's because of the Kindle Unlimited readers. You get a lot of reads. And it's a long set. It's a long book. You get a lot of pages in there. So people just keep reading pages, 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 pages. It adds up. And I, yeah. I did the math and I'm like, wait a minute. There's actually something to this. It's a lost leader in a, in a way, but you do make good money out of it if, if it works. So now, then I'm like, okay. Why isn't that hurt the series though? Well, okay. So here's the thing. If I, if I, I mean, I did the math. I looked at it on my back, back list. How much does my back list make collectively? And can I revive it without bundling? And the answer was no, not really. I could revive a little bit, like little, you know, jumps here and there, and it would make me a little bit extra money, but nothing major. And the box sets was like this, you know, this completely different market of readers that are voracious, and they just want a whole series all in one grab, and they're really cheap. They don't want to pay more than 99 cents. And I'm like, so how do I access this market? Well, I'll just copy what I see other people are doing and release a bunch of box sets, do my whole backlist. And I did that, and I booked all the promos I could for these these box sets and it was completely counterintuitive for me something i was a little reluctant about obviously because of the price it's like you're discounting your work so much yeah. uh but in the end it just made sense to me from the perspective that well this is kind of the trend in in the world right now with entertainment is people want a subscription service they want to pay a certain amount per month and then just binge yeah right and so that's what kindle unlimited is it's the netflix of books yeah and i'm just like well okay so i can i can I can just ignore and sort of overlook the people that are buying it and giving me nothing in order to access that group that they're reading through subscription program and I'm getting a piece of that pie, right? Yeah. And in the end, it worked out so well that I was able to recover all my losses and make massive profits. And I'm still to this day making those massive profits because of those box sets. Nice. Uh, I think it basically worked out that collectively, it was about $90,000 that they made in the last five months. That's Maybe a little more. Thing. Yeah, it's really, really decent. It pulled me back from that, you know, that cliff of that brink of like, okay, I can't pay my bills at this point. What do I do? And then I just kept on my, you know, usual release schedule. And I said to Audible, well, look, we didn't have, you know, fixed dates in our contract. That was something I had negotiated. We don't have a, an exact schedule to release these books. So right now they're sometime in 2020. It's scheduled for the future <laughs> didn't give them a day and you know the last three of that contract so i still have three standalone books that i have to write for them but it's going to be you know from from now on it's going to be my side gig so i'm going to be taking a couple hours each day to write those books and yeah. kind of get them done this year but not in any particular hurry yeah. because i got to keep something on the front that's you know coming out every two to three months i was going to ask you because it took you like six to nine months for those other books to come out where did you start work on other projects and then yeah and and so i did and i wrote another book and uh you know that sort of helped me because at some point when i decided okay this isn't going to work i switched back i was able to get the book out faster so it was only a one month gap between my last sell so my simultaneously published uh uh, book, standalone book, and the next one. So the next one was First Encounter, and it just happened to do really, really well. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, uh, so, you know, now I can, I can, I can recover. I'm using look to see he's the same um, uh, cover artist. Um, yeah, he's really good. He's really, really good. good. Uh, he's a bit expensive uh, nowadays because he has so many people asking for him, but I mean, he's worth it. I pay about a thousand dollars a cover. Yeah. Uh, you can probably get it for less, depending on what the complexity of the scene is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's worth it though, because if you have the right cover, you have the right ad description for mm -hmm. it, 
the book and the series will take off. And if you Absolutely. have the wrong one. No, you're done. You're dead you're in the done. water. Yeah. You know? And I mean, that's yeah. what, a, what I attribute my, a lot of my success with Dark Space, the first book, was some of my, a lot of my focus actually it wasn't just the book. It was, okay, got to have a great cover and it's got to have a really snappy book description because those are the first things that anybody sees when they want to buy a book. They don't know yeah. if the book's any good. That's what makes them decide to buy. Yeah. 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 And we had that issue with our current series too. I got, I created the, the covers my, my guy created were, were great covers. But the problem was they read as nonfiction. Yeah, then you get a problem. You're yeah, accessing problem. the wrong market. And it, was, it was a problem. And I, I, I thought they looked great, so I ran with it. And that hurt me for the first three months that the series was rolling. And then I was like, crap, what's going on? So then we changed the covers that we have now um, that you see on the screen. And right. we did that. I, I worked with Brian Meeks, and we redid all of my um, ad descriptions and once we did that, the series just took off. It's That's been off great. the races ever since then. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I would I look at mistake. I lost probably fifty, sixty thousand dollars because of that mistake for about, you know three yeah. or four months like that. Yeah, just launching with the wrong the wrong face on it, basically. They say don't judge a book by its cover, but you know, oh, you actually <laughs> we all do. So you. it's it's the wrong adage. It's more like people judge books by their covers. So keep that in mind. <laughs> That's what yeah, I should say. <laughs> cool cover. It just was the wrong cover for the genre yeah. type of book I wrote. Yeah. Uh, it, it really it, it's I kick myself for because I really, really set myself up for failure. And I, I'm like, well, I mean, but series. you never, I'm like, never, you you never know. You know, so I you never know it. how that that played into things, but I I get you because I have a few regrets like that. Like I started out with Dark Space and sold at ninety nine cents for a long time the first book, and then yeah. the second book one ninety nine. And I always think, wonder if people would have paid two ninety nine. You know, <laughs> like you I could have done test. so much better. You got to test. You got to test yeah. the prices. And I, I didn't. I just I just said, you know what? Whether I make less money or not, the the goal here should be I'm a new author. So let's just get into many hands, yeah. as many hands as possible and get my You're a veteran there. author now. You're well known. Your series is killing it. You should definitely price check, you know, check that because again, someone doesn't like that price. Well, guess what? It's free in KU. So they can yeah, use it for free. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean that it just depends because I did a price test recently with box sets and I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe that's correct. Maybe I should raise the prices. So I bump them up to two ninety nine. And I just see work. immediately, immediately drops off a cliff in sales and I, and the rankings start going down. And I'm like, okay, Even then. With KU. <laughs> Even with KU. KU, you would think it shouldn't matter, but it does. Wow. And it's just a completely different segment of the market. They see those box sets. And yeah. you probably have your, your serious readers who they want to know that it's high quality. Probably will skip those entirely. They'll be like, no, I don't know that that's a good quality because it's 99 cents. Exactly. But then you have these other readers who are just the bottom feeders that are very cheap and they want they want quantity more than quality yeah and they want to get a whole series all at once and they don't have to wait for the next installment and then you get those readers are completely different there's a lot of them and then there's the people in ku that they don't even pay attention to the price yeah. so well, one of the it's, strategies, it's really interesting i was gonna say a strategy that's really worked for me i talked about this on um with uh, uh james blatch from self-publishing formula was really on, on the pre-order strategies. That's something I've really kind of mastered is when you sell a book, the challenge is you've got all these people who have now read your book. But if you don't have something waiting in the wings for them to read, they're gonna go somewhere else. And then you have exactly. to retarget them. Exactly. So what I've done is before the, the next book launches, I have the pre-order up for the subsequent book or book yeah. one of the new series. And it's hyperlinked at the end of the book. So when they finish reading it, they go, oh, I can pre-order the next one. And I always exactly. release early, so they never know when it's going to come out, but they know exactly. it's going to come out early. And that's allowed me to capture thousands of pre-orders by doing that. And those are people I don't have to pay to retarget and try to find again. And so day one comes you know, it, out, it, it, it makes out the pre-orders. Exactly. It makes good sense. I've been trying to do that a little bit better lately. Um, but I, I still botched it. My last book, I put out Occupied Earth and I didn't have the pre-order for the next one up yet. And the links in the back weren't the right ones. But delay the launch. You know, if you don't have a pre-order yeah, for the I launch, mean, delay the launch until you can. I, there's two different schools of thought on it. And I think that's where I, I get kind of caught up and not sure what to do. And then I just don't do either. 
and what happens is <laughs> I sit on the fence and I'm like, I don't know what to pick. I, maybe I'll pick nothing, you know, <laughs> but it, there's another school thought which says, well, don't do the pre-orders because Amazon will let people know when the new book comes out ah, and you'll just get a bigger boost. That. Never trust that. You know, that. but uh, it's like you say, and I think you're right. People's attention spans are just not long enough. So well, if you, if it, you have Amazon, to retarget them or, or recapture them later, you won't. You'll, you'll, you'll get a subset. Well, and you get an email from Amazon almost daily. How many times do yeah. you honestly open that email? Oh, man, I, rarely. <laughs> so, exactly. So that exactly. email has got your new release in it. And yeah. that's the attitude. So at least if you got the pre-order, you're hoping to capture some of it. Yeah. Now, oh, man, now that Amazon made the pre-orders out to one year. Oh, you can, you can put a whole series so up in pre-order. Yeah, exactly. It's been great. Yeah. Because um, before, man, that ninety days man, that really sucked. You were yeah, really it wasn't it wasn't enough. Really tight. Yeah, it was yeah. Really and not tough. everybody could not everybody could write a book in three months. So that, well, that was an issue. Is we would re usually write three books before we started releasing book one. So when book one was released, book two was already up for hyperlink for pre order. But we were already right. book three was already in editing. Book four was already being written. So we were always you always had a fast ahead. release cycle. Yes, yeah, so we had had one coming out every 90 days, but we always had the three books ahead for whatever was coming out. So like well, right that's, now, that's a good place to be in for sure. Yeah, and, and like uh, right now we've got book, book five is up for pre-order. It's the last book in the series. Um, but I'm already on book three of the new sci-fi series. So book five is not out, but I've already got the next three kind of lined up. So when yeah. that comes out, book one of the new series is going to be hyperlinked at the end to start the new well, series. Well, that's really great because it actually also means that you've got uh, – if anything happens, for example, and you can't write for a while, you've already got your next six months of income figured out, you right. know, at least maybe more. It just needs to go through editing and it's already taken care of in the covers. Yeah, exactly. So, so you're in a position where you're, you're ahead of your income cycle, you know, more, more so than the average, I would, I would say. It's, just, it's a lot of work. It's a grind. But, you know, I look at it that this isn't like any other tech startup. It's just a lot of hours, a lot of time. But if you can grind for you know, a handful of years to do it, you can really set up, set yourself up and build a really good business exactly. um, to set your family up. Cause you know, I'm not going to do this forever. You know, I'm going to write for, a right. I mean, at some point everybody point. retires. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Especially with the fast release cycle where you're constantly writing something new. Like I, I think most writers, like every six months is what I'd like. Yeah. To most writers, that would be our, our ideal. You know, we could write one book every six months, you know, one to two books a year. That would be like, Oh yeah. And we're on a beach somewhere the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, that's when you're retired and you're thinking, well, the income's not as important as the quality of life and, and yeah. you know, I'll those wait. golden if, years. If 47 North uh, picks up the series, then I'll, I'll be on probably the six month cycle. Cause I think that's what they do. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do. So that'd be fine with me, but we'll wait and see what happens with that. How that shakes out. If not, I'll yeah. be doing it on my own, like I normally do. So I'm fine with that too. So. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens, but well, I've got little munchkins starting to melt down, so it's probably <laughs> I can time hear that. Yeah, to go help my wife and uh, handle that. Whereas you know, oh, yeah. we're all in quarantine, and guess yeah. what? I live in Florida. It's, 80, it's 93 degrees out. I can't take my kids to the beach. I can't go to the YMCA. I can't go to a freaking playground. Wow! So, can you even go outside? Can you walk around your neighborhood? Yes, you can walk outside your neighborhood. Okay. Thank God. You're, you're one better than me. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little, little I'm not, they're not that strange just yet, but, uh, you know, it's getting a little crazy. Well, we're, um, we're, I'd say our, our methods here in Panama are a lot more strict. So I'm, I'm, we can't even go out the door basically, unless it's during two hours of the day that we're allowed to. And actually wow. they just made it even stricter where now there's only three days of the week that you can go out and they're different days for men and women. Wow. And you can't, you can't go out as a couple or as a family at all. So it's one you person at a time leaves the house. What's that? I mean, do you have Uber Eats or some kind of food delivery? Yeah, we can we can order in food, um, and so we can at least do that. I haven't actually been doing it because I did stock up actually even before the quarantine started. I'm like I, I could see it coming, it. and I I just stocked up. I even went, I when bought a big chest deep freezer and filled it up with food, but it turned out I didn't need to because there wasn't any run on supermarkets here. People didn't have enough money to go and buy three months in advance, and yeah. so it just turns out everything's still fully stocked. You know, but in the U.S. and Canada, everybody would just go nuts and grab oh, everything. Did. And they there was did. a run on toilet paper. So it was like, it was kind of interesting to watch that from a distance. It was nuts. You would go over to, you know, Costco and people would be in line for like three, four hours in the morning before Costco yeah. even opened. Wow. Dude, okay. That is crazy. Insane. You know, and. Yeah, and that's crazy. We never got to that here, thankfully. 
Well, I mean, I saw all this coming. I, got, I used all my military training. I was like, I saw this coming. So we were well stocked up on food and ammo and you know, and <laughs> firearms and plenty of water. And well, I was you know, I was just about to buy a gun, and then I'm like, you know what? They're just about to start this quarantine thing. There's probably going to be some paperwork to fill out, and then I'm not even going to get it anyways. And and here it wasn't as much of an issue because I have great security in the house. Yeah, so I'm like well, whatever. <laughs> here in America. No, in America, you need it. Responding very well to calls right now because yeah. you know they're too busy handling you know really big stuff and other things that are going on, and then you got that. Then they're getting infected too and going down. Exactly. So issues that it's it's a whole thing, and and the problem I think is yeah. Well, here we're used to burglaries at the very least, so all of our houses have iron bars and all the windows and all the doors really? are are security doors, not just like pretty doors. So I actually have the entire house fully secured house. And, with a, and with a concrete wall of 2.5 meters around the whole property. So, Dang. you know, and on top of that, the neighborhood has a, a wall with an electric fence on top and 24 hour security. So yeah, you have a Rottweiler. No, I don't have a Rottweiler, oh. but I have, a, <laughs> I have the external security and I have two Chihuahuas, which will bite, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have a, I don't, I don't have a dog, but I've got a couple handguns. So you know. Yeah, I, I was tempted. I was just about to. Then I'm like, you know what? It's not that type of situation. Thankfully, not where I am at least. So I'll, I'll wait. I'll, I'll hold off on that. Well, <laughs> Maybe next like time. One of these weird states, you know, because I grew up in Chicago, you know, Chicago, and then moved into Wisconsin. And you know, I went to high school and college in Wisconsin. And yeah. it's weird down here in Florida because we have a. I've never been in a state with this many people that have a concealed carry permit. It's wow. I had, I, there I had are no idea. Florida. I would have thought Florida has fewer guns than the average. Yeah, like so we have Texas, about 20, you, you definitely assume it, but <laughs> we have about 21 million people that live in the state of that probably about four to four and a half million have a concealed carry permit. Wow. So you just state. don't know who's packing. You don't know who's packing. But statistically <laughs> it's like one, it's almost like it's pretty good. Pretty, it's pretty, it's crazy. And because they're largely older people, yeah, you know, they're largely the ones that are packing. That's <laughs> you know, crazy, <laughs> Grandpa. <laughs> you know? Man, but it does. It certainly creates a climate and a situation, and I think where everybody feels like they need to have a weapon because you know your neighbors have them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, it becomes you know, an anti-up situation. Well, and I'm friends with the guy who runs the gun store over in our our area here, and um, he goes to one of the nearby churches, and one of my other friends at another church is really good friends with him, and so he introduced me to him and. Uh, it's it's really funny. He's told me that he has sold more firearms in the last uh, last six weeks than he has sold in the previous year. I I believe it. He yeah. said they, I mean, he, he was selling out of ammo, and he would have people walk in, and they don't know anything about a gun, and they'd be like, "So, what gun do you have ammo for?" In <laughs> he's like, "Well, this ten millimeter." He's like, "I'll take it." <laughs> yeah, you know, he's like this but, is ludicrous. <laughs> that's a little bit worrying too, though, it's because crazy. you've got a lot of people buying guns that don't know how to use them. I know. And then you're like, so what are the odds that there's going to be some misfiring and you know improper handling of these weapons? I mean, I've got, actually, it's crazy because I mean, like, I've got ten years of experience in the military, eight more as a contractor where I'm carrying a firearm, you know, an M9 and a right. A so you know what you're doing, but I know a lot of these people. I twenty years experience doing this stuff. I had to go get a <laughs> special licensing and permits and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, got a lot of training on this stuff. These guys are like, they're yeah. just walking like, walking so what's a good street. gun? You got <laughs> ammo for something? <laughs> All right. Thank God. There's at least a five day wait or three day waiting period in Florida, you know, so at least they got to wait. Right. That, but, you know, at least. But, that's, but, man, kind of crazy. that's crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, I really appreciate the All conversation right. in the chat. It's been fun to talk some more and get to know you. And, uh, when I tell my wife we're ready to go globe trotting around the world again, we will definitely have to make a pit stop down there in Panama. Yeah, and stop by. We'll just show you around. You guys for a couple months and uh, for sure. Off there, you know? <laughs> for sure. <laughs> we'll get an Airbnb <laughs> nearby and just hang out. Today. Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Midnight nice talking to you, James. Wherever we go, I want to put two. I want to spend two months. So it's enough time to familiarize. And well, yeah, that's that's a good right. policy. So. Yeah. Well, it's great talking with you. We'll talk again, and uh, hopefully your readers will have some questions. They can post them in the comments down below, and uh, we'll see where things go. All right. Been great talking to you, James. Have uh, a good one. Later. You too. Bye-bye.